the intro there. I'm here to talk about S Codec and Shapeless. Um, Shapeless is a really neat library. Uh, it's one that's taken me a long time to learn like layer after layer. Um, I think I've got like a, an idea of one part of it and then a few months will go by and I'll get another piece of it. Um, it's by no means a library I learned like, you know, within a few weeks or anything. Um, and I think what's really neat about it is that it's like really mind bending at times, but the way we use it in S Codec is like just, it's very mundane, right? Like there's really nothing exciting about converting binary to case classes and vice versa. Um, and yet something that's so mundane as like binary conversions can be um, taking advantage of some like really interesting features of the Scala type system. So anyway, it's kind of what I want to talk about today. Um, so I know a lot of people in the room, but I don't know everybody. So um, I've been using Scala for a while. We've been using it at work since 2008. Um, you know, Brian mentioned this. I, I'm the author of the S Codec uh, series of libraries. I'm also like a contributor of a bunch of stuff like Cats, um, Scala Z Stream, Scala Z, that kind of stuff. Um, kind of like the functional, you know, libraries in Scala. Um, and I work at CCAD. We're a joint venture between Aris and Comcast. We're based out of Horsham. Okay, so S Codec is a very modular library um, or, or suite of libraries, um, and like these are the the major pieces, um, the, or the major modules of S-Codec, the light blue stuff are like the primary modules. So like S-Codec Bits was like a super stable library for just um, immutable persistent data structures for working with binary. So like if you ever had to like pass around a byte array and you got bit by equals not being like defined semantically, right, instead of being like reference equals, um, there's something for that in S-Codec Bits. Um, or just like silly stuff like base conversions, um, cyclic redundancy checks, like all that kind of stuff. S-Codec Bits is a library that supports that. Um, it's super stable, right? So the idea of S Codec Bits is that it's a library that's safe for other libraries to depend on. And like you don't want to get into uh, dependency management nightmares of like, well, S Codec Core is using S Codec Bits 1 and S Scala Streams using S Codec Bits 2 and now there's some weird dependency issue I can't resolve things, right? Um, so S Codec Bits is super stable, does not change very often at all. Um, today's talk, I want to talk about S Codec Core and Shapeless. So S Codec Core is like the, the main library that lets us do bindings between um, binary and Scala objects. I'm going to show some examples of that in a minute. But there's also like lots of other cool stuff. Um, so if you need to do like streaming binary, you've got like infinitely um, large uh, streams of binary data. Like maybe you're processing like live video feeds or something. There, there's ways to do all of that in these other libraries here. Okay, so um, getting right to code. Um, here's a very simple set of uh, case classes, right? We've got a point that's just a product type of two integers, um, a line that's just two points, right? A starting point and an ending point. We have like this uh, somewhat arbitrary arrangement case class, just like a, a vector of lines. So we can just create um, an arrangement and we'll give it uh, two lines, right? So for the first bit of code with S codec that I want to show today, um, is just how like we could take that arrangement variable and convert it to binary and vice versa. Um, so the first thing I want to do is import like the S codec um, codec type. That's like the main encoder decoder, the the object that lets us go to and from binary. And I'm going to import like a whole host of implicit values, um, which we're not going to look at the details of. Um, and then you know all we have to do to convert it to binary is call codec dot encode of our arrangement, and then require the result. The require thing is basically saying that um, if it fails, just throw an exception. Um, it's sort of like an either, sort of like a try, kind of, um, if you're familiar with uh, try from the standard library. Um, but anyway, you can see here, like, we've got this 288-bit bit vector. Um, you know, it's printed out. The two-string here prints out, like, the hex form of it. But, you know, you can sort of see, like, in the beginning of it, there's, like, a 32-bit value. That's the number two. It's saying there's, like, two entries in our, in our line vector. Um, and then there's other things down there, like towards the right, you can see a 0a somewhere, right? So it's like hex 10, and so, you know, some of our points were at point 10. So, like, the, the idea is that the binary is in there. Uh, we can go in the inverse direction. The inverse direction is kind of a, a little bit different in that we want to go and say, like, well, go and find me a codec for this arrangement type, which we're doing here with um, codec bracket arrangement, right? Um, that's going and, like, searching for an implicit, uh, you know, codec for arrangements. And then we're just going to decode that binary. Um, again, we're going to you know, ask it to throw an exception if it was unable to decode the binary. Um, then we're going to pull the value out of um, the decoded binary. Um, 
so like there's a lot of things happening here, right? The syntax here is not anything maybe that interesting. Um, and like if you're if you've seen like Scala pickling, for instance, or if you've worked with tools like Avro, um, maybe this is not that exciting. Um, so I want to talk about like what what actually is occurring in these examples. Um, at compile time, this is the kind of the key point. Um, there's a bunch of stuff that happened. Um, you know, basically what what's occurring is for each of those three case classes we looked at, like um, arrangement, line, and point, um, we had some code from Escoda kick in and use a lot, uh, a lot of pieces of shapeless to generate implicit instances of a codec type for each of those case classes. Um, so basically it said like, well, let's create this you know, codec for arrangement, um, but in order to do that, we're going to have to like first encode the number of entries in our vector, and then we're going to have to encode each individual line in the vector using whatever implicitly available you know, codec for, for line uh, is out there. Um, and this all works recursively, right? So it's then able to say, okay, well, this, you know, where can I get this codec of line from? Well, we're going to try to like generate one again at compile time. Um, you know, as long as we've got, you know, the, uh, in this case, codec align was, um, you know, just dealing with two different points. So as long as we can find like an implicit codec available that knows how to encode and decode the individual point data types, then we can just kind of put those together, concatenate the binary. We've got a codec for line. So like a bunch of things are occurring here, and like the key point is that this is all at compile time. It's effectively code generation. Um, there is zero runtime reflection here. In fact, the, the runtime performance of S codec is very, very, very high. Um, so S codec itself is not really about that. Um, S codec itself is really about uh, working with like formal protocols, right? If you have a protocol that's uh, identified by like a standards body that says this is what this message looks like, um, and you need to um, write some code to, to convert that message to something in Scala, um, S codec is designed exactly for that use case. So that like automatic generation we saw a minute ago is sort of like a nice bonus feature because S codec uses shapeless and all these things come together in a really nice way. Um, but like since we really, really, really care about the specific binary format, right? The main use case is, is dealing with these predefined protocols. Um, the whole library is compositional and it's all built into these small like combinators. Um, these, these methods that basically take codecs and then add something to them, add some behavior, transform what they do um, in various ways. So like in this example, we import the zlib codec, right? And the zlib codec will take like a codec um, of some type A as an argument, of any type A. In this case, we're passing out a codec of arrangement, and it gives us back a codec of type A that's just going to compress, you know, the, the, the binary after it's been generated. So of course, you know, we do the same example, we get less bits, 152 bits instead of 288 bits, right? and we can decode the same way. So a very simple combinator in this case, one that just adds compression, um, but this general idea of, of writing these very small methods, like the zlib method, that takes you know, a codec of some shape and gives you back a codec of another shape. We'll see a lot of that um, as we go forward. By the way, uh, feel free to interrupt me um, with any questions. Okay, um, so let's we can do the same example, but we can change the way uh, or we can change the implicits that are available in implicit scope. Um, so when it's deriving or, or generating these codecs at compile time, uh, the behavior changes a little bit. So in this case, we're going to do the exact same code, um, same exact example, but we're going to import all of the implicits package except for this implicit in codec. Um, so we're going to say like import implicits, uh, but but you know um, hide the implicit in codec value and import everything else. And now we're going to def um, define an explicit implicit um, of, of, of type, you know, codec int, but we're going to use this like unsigned int 8 um, value. And really what this does is like a 32-bit, um, uh, you know, unsigned big Indian. Well, it's only 8-bit, so. But anyway, it's 32-bit um, unsigned int. Eight, sorry, 8-bit unsigned int. Who here does not understand that import state? The one with the arrow. Yeah, it's really wacky. It's basically what it's saying is um, the second underscore is like a star, import everything. But the first one says map implicit in Kodak to nothing. Okay, so essentially if you think of it that way, what Michael said is exactly what it's doing. I want everything except implicit Kodak, which I want to map to nothing. It's a way of doing an import except. 
and it is a weird syntax, which is the only yeah, reason right, I interrupted right. to bring it up. No, it's good because you know it's a syntax that I have to look up every time I need it, um, because it's 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 definitely uh, it's kind of strange. Yeah. They say Martin Odersky has six underscore keys. <laughs> yes. <laughs> when in doubt, underscore is probably the answer, right? <laughs> Um, yeah, so anyway, like you can see in this example, because we didn't import the 32-bit int codec that came from that implicits package, and instead we put like an unsigned 8-bit integer codec into implicit scope, when we encoded our arrangement, we, we got 72 bits, right? All of the integers all throughout that structure, and there were a bunch, um, ended up being small. Um, So the other kind of interesting thing about this automatic code generation that's occurring um, is that by using this unsigned 8-bit integer codec, we can encode value, or we can ask to encode values that cannot be encoded, right? If my field is only an unsigned 8-bit integer, I can only encode numbers 0 to 255. What happens if someone tries to encode an arrangement that's got a negative 1 somewhere in it? So it, this time, notice like when we call in code, I'm not calling require on the end. Now, had I called require, we would have gotten a big stack trace, right, with a nice exception. But um, you know, here we get this attempt back, which again, sort of like a, an either, right, or sort of like a try. And it's saying that we attempted to convert it to a bit vector, but we got a failure. Um, negative one is less than minimum value zero for eight bit unsigned integer. But notice the prefix path, or like this context path that says like. You try to encode this big arrangement structure, and we're going to give you the path through that structure down to the field that has the error. So in this case, it says, like, starting at the lines list inside the arrangement, at the first index of that vector, not the zeroth index, right? Um, at the end position and the y position, we had a failure. Um, so I was able to do this, again, like, no, no code that I didn't show. This is all of the code for these examples. Um, it's all of this uh, code generation stuff. So I keep saying code generation, but it really isn't like macros, and we're going to talk about that. Like there, there are zero macros in what we saw so far, um, and zero compiler plugins, like zero fancy stuff. It's all well, it's all um, using features that are that are from Shapeless. Okay. Anyway, like I said, S codec is really about working with explicit codecs, not all this auto generation stuff. Um, so here's sort of like a bad version of maybe what like a transport stream header looks like from an MPEG um, stream. Like I work with MPEG streams a lot. Um, and I say bad because like, like for instance, this PID field in the middle of it uh, is like a really important value to me, a really important type to me, right? It's, it's, it's 0 to 8191. And like as just like a random int, that's a little too open for my taste, right? But to make this, the example simple, I've got this header that's three booleans and four integers. That's sort of the point here. So there's like a spec that's like 25 years old that tells me what one of these things look like in binary. And this is sort of what, you know, a version of that would look like in S codec. If I really want to control every bit of the output, right? And there's a bunch of things happening here. Like we're using individual codecs in this right hand column. Like we're going to say that it starts with like this constant 0x47 binary, um, this single, single field. We've got like three one bit Boolean fields. Here's something really strange. We've got a 13-bit unsigned integer field. Like, have fun doing that in Java, right? I mean, I've done it like a thousand times, and I, every single time I, I kind of cringe. And then, you know, okay, maybe some things that are a little easier to work with, like we've got an unsigned int2, another 2-bit unsigned int field, and a 4-bit unsigned int field. So, like, they're not terrible, but um, still they're, they're uh, not fun to, to deal with. So why are you got... Uh, Consing style operators over there, but the first one is different. Can you explain the difference, or am I jumping the gun? Um, yeah, the, we will get to that in okay. about an hour. <laughs> um, <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Um, it was magic for now, that's fine. Yeah, I want to leave that one for magic. Um, but yeah, they, they are basically consing, and I'm going to sh show you exactly what that is in a little bit. Um, but kind of the takeaway I want here is just that, um, like, everything in S codec is, is a codec itself. And, or as a combinator to let you manipulate a codec into something bigger. So like I think someone once said, I, um, I think it was J uh, John DeGose who once said that like uh, you can measure like the functionalness or, or, or compositionality of a library by the number of types it introduces. Um, and I really like the fact that in S codec we have very few types. 
right? Like everything's a codec. Um, and like just finding like the right abstraction of, of, of the library, uh, maybe take some time. Like we just added a feature that probably should have been there the whole time, just, just like three months ago. Um, but anyway, I think it's really interesting the fact that like those one bit Boolean fields are codecs, but like this big crazy structure is also just a codec and all these combinators just build them up. Um, the other thing here is that there's all these strings, right? And these strings are really just strings that go into those, those error messages. So we saw that error message with the path through the structure. Um, those strings are like what's labeling the error messages. Um, so anyway. Hey Michael. Yeah. Is yeah. there like the 30 second version of um, the, like the, the, the business, you know, the business aspects that you serve that, that basically drive, you know, this level of, uh, of depth for you? Like what, what do you, you know, what kind of problems do you solve on a day to day basis that yeah. push you into this lane? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so I build control systems. Okay. Um, so we, like our, our, our kind of classic systems control like millions of devices, be them set-top boxes or equipment in set-top boxes or like equipment that's in cable head ends that communicate with set-top boxes. Like we do a lot of kind of meta control, if you will. Um, so anyway, all of those devices have binary protocols that are very formal. Right. A lot of times designed by standards bodies. Right, okay. Um, and we write a lot of code to, to do binary right. conversion. So, so yeah, this passing, helps us a lot. No, no. <laughs> Even our web services are like XML with like very fancy uh, schemas and stuff. Yeah. No JSON. Thank you. Sure, sure. Okay. Um, so that's all I'm going to show for S Codec for a while. We'll come back to S Codec later. I just kind of wanted to give a very brief intro um, because I think one of the things people run into with Shapeless is that um, maybe some of the examples sort of make sense. You know, if you if you read a blog post about them, but at least for me, I never knew like how to apply it to a problem that, that I ran into. And I, I want to point out that like we're using a lot of features of Shapeless in just the, these examples. Um, and yet it almost, Shapeless almost did not appear in like the Surface API, in, in the APIs that we were actually using in these examples. I say almost because like we never had an import for Shapeless, right? And I, I should point out, I, I tried to keep all the imports accurate, right? So like if you try to execute this code, it should run. Um, and we never did import anything from Shapeless, but like some of the types of the things that we just went through, if you looked at them in, in like IntelliJ or you looked at them at, at, at the REPL, you would see Shapeless data types. But other times we didn't. Like the very first example we started with like three basic case classes and we just started generating binary, right? There was no Shapeless whatsoever. Um, yet there was, right? There was, it was not visible, but there was plenty of Shapeless actually occurring. So there's all sorts of things here, um, features of Shapeless. I'm gonna try to talk about these today. Um, unfortunately, this talk is, is sort of long and, um, I had a whole another section that, that was about twice, it would have made the talk about twice as long that I had to cut, um, that gets into some really neat stuff about Shapeless. So maybe one day if, if you like this, we could do a part two, maybe. All right. So let's talk about Shapeless. Um, and I'm going to start with something that's not Shapeless. I'm going to start with, um, like a regular immutable persistent list, a cons list. So this is basically Scala collection immutable list, at least the start of it. And so I want to kind of call everybody's attention to a couple different features. We've got a sealed trait. It takes a single type parameter. Um, we're going to define that type parameter covariantly, right? Um, we're going to define our sentinel value, our nil, and we're going to extend it as list of nothing. All right, we're going to extend it as list of nothing because nothing is a subtype of everything, right? And list is covariant, so now nil can be a list of anything. In fact, nil can be on the end of list of int, it can be on the end of list of string, right? It can be everything. So like that, that kind of relationship is really important in this case where I can define nil as a case object. I can have one nil for all data types because it's covariant. And then we're going to defi uh, define our con cell. Um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll define it literally as colon colon. Um, it'll also have a type parameter of A, it'll also be covariant, it'll have a head value of type A, and then a tail of another list. Okay. Um, the other kind of wacky thing is because we defined A in list as covariant, we want to be able to define this cons method on list that just constructs one of our cons cells, right? But if we just try to do that directly, we get a compiler error saying you've got a covariant position or covariant parameter in a contravariant position, right? 
And so we do this trick where we say, like, well, you can't cons an A onto the front of a list of A, but you can cons a super type of A onto the front of a, a, a list of A. So that's all we're doing here is saying, like, give us some, some type AA, which is a super type of A, right? Otherwise, it's exactly what you'd expect. And when you do this with, like, a list, it does exactly what you expect, right? If I have, like, a list that just has a 1 in it and I cons a 2 on the front of it, I still have a list of int. In that case, my AA and A equal the same type. Okay, so I want to start today with um, heterogeneous lists in shape lists um, and contrast that to what we just saw with regular value lists. Um, so heterogeneous lists. Uh, there's a couple things right off the bat that are different. Um, one is that our list you know, um, top type here is not going to take a type parameter. So an H list, a heterogeneous list, uh, does not take a parameter, does not store like values of a given type, right? Um, but it's also going to, you know, just like just like list, it's also going to have two subtypes. It'll have H nil to represent the end sentinel value, um, and it's going to have a cons cell. Um, turns Sorry, out, like, yeah, go ahead. You keep using the term cons. I'm not familiar with what that means. Oh yeah, sure. Um, cons is um, how I'm pronouncing colon colon. It comes from Lisp. Yeah. Oh, okay. And it comes from the notion that. A list is actually recursively defined as a head with a sublist, right. and then that sublist is, of course, recursively defined as a head with a sublist. Right. Okay. And so you can you can use the consign operator to okay. put them together, but also pull them apart. Yeah, I, I typically say colon colon, but I by the end of a talk I get so sick of that phrase <laughs> it does not flow from the tongue. Well, Consist. I mean, you'll see that term in, in Scala documentation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it comes directly from where you. Can, where you'll see this the most and where you're probably used to seeing this is in a pattern match where you pattern match against a list mm -hmm. and you want to deconstruct the list and say, look, you know, this pattern match against the list, if it matches nil, I'm done this recursive function. If it matches uh, some head object followed by a sublist, which may or may not be nil, I want to do the following thing and then call myself recursively. That's a really, really common pattern in this language. Yeah. Um, and the constant operator was uh, designed to make that readable. Yeah, so in this case, um, our cons type, our, our um, case class here, is going to be very similar. But rather than a regular list where we had like a single type parameter A, here we're going to define a cons list as taking two type parameters, a head type parameter H, and a tail type parameter T. And then we're going to put a constraint on T to say it has to be another H list. Okay. Um, then we're just going to say our, our head value, it's just a regular case class, right? So we have accessors, we have constructor generated, we've got an apply method generated. Our, our accessors, um, for head, it's going to return a value of type H, and for tail, we'll return a value of type T. Um, we kind of did something weird here in the middle, right? We added this extra sealed trait H nil. Like, we didn't have that in the other one, right? Um, and this is just working around weirdness in Scala's type system, or, or I shouldn't say that, but like it's by encoding an H nil in this way, we're going to want to talk about the type of the value H nil. So is anybody like at a REPL, let's try this real quick, like at a REPL um, define something like, let's say case object foo. Um, and then we said like val f equals foo. Um, the type of f is not foo, it's foo.type. Right? Like written out, it's it's literally this foo.type thing. The command 23 is just like a REPL side effect. Um, but the type of our of our case object foo is actually foo.type. It's the singleton type, the one and only you know, type that references our case object. So when we're over here in HList land. We're going to want to talk about the type of h nil sometimes. And I don't want like h nil dot type generated all the time because it's going to annoy people. So we're going to define a trait with the same type and it's a little trick. And now we've got like a slightly more general type that represents a super type of h nil but a subtype of h list. Um, and now I don't have to worry about this weird singleton type thing getting inferred all over the place. Um, because Scala goes to kind of great efforts not to infer singleton types when it can. So anyway, don't worry too much about that, but, but we're going to insert this weird extra parent class here. Um, now we want to define cons. And like on the value list, we could define cons, or, you know, we defined cons directly on the list trait. 
I'm not going to do that here, and instead we'll define cons directly on h nil and directly on the case class. Um, so let's look at the h nil case first. Uh, h nil represents an empty list, an empty heterogeneous list. Um, so consing something in front of an empty heterogeneous list is as simple as saying create a new con cell with the new value in front and have our sentinel value this at the end. right? So the, the, the right-hand side of our equal sign is not that interesting. The left-hand side is a little more interesting in that the return type of our cons method here is h cons h nil. And like this isn't some weird syntax. This is taking advantage of Scala, which I'll talk about in a minute, that like any type constructor of two parameters, like in this case our cons case class, can be written in fix. And I'll, I'll give a bunch of examples of that in a minute. But the weird thing is our type is not an h list, right? Our return type of this method is not an h list. It's an h cons h nil. And that can, you can make that the, you're going to get to the, the in fix versus. Yes. Yeah, yeah we'll slide on examples. Line. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so hold on to that syntax. That's kind of mind bending. I'll, I'll explain it uh, in one second. Um, let's look at cons though. Like if, if I have a non-empty list and I want to stick something on the front of a non-empty list here, um, we'll define that to take a type G um, and a new value G to put on the head. And now we've got a really wacky return type of like G in front of H in front of T, which again, hold on to that for a minute, I'll explain it. But like the right-hand side is just obvious, right? The right-hand side is just creating a con cell. It's exactly the same as like our regular case back here, of like new con cell of, of the new head and the, the new tail. So like, what's up with these types is the weird thing. Like, why are these return types so strange? Um, so I want to do um, some examples. Um, so, so using shapeless and using immutable lists, um, let's do a couple different examples. Uh, first, we'll just take like one, two, three on top of nil. Um, this is our normal list of int in, in Scala collections. If we do one, two, three on top of h nil, we get this type back. And there's some things I want to point out about it. Like, First, we know um, how many elements are in the list statically, right? Like the size of that list is encoded in its static type. The type system can reason about it, or we can reason about it with the type system. Um, and in this case, we know that like the head is an integer, um, that the second element's an int, the third element's an int, and then, then we're at the end. That's what that type's telling us. Um, notice that like we, you know, the REPL here printed this out in, um, in like our prefix form, right? Our cons form of like a head and a tail. And uh, we have this right nesting of types. So our, like our, our outermost type represents like the one on top of the rest. And then like if you move in to the right, you know, one side, then we got a two on top of the rest, a three on top of H and L and we're at the end. So like, let's, let's talk about this infix versus um, prefix notation. So hey, like I said, Scala has this feature. Uh, it's, a, it's a purely a syntax feature that says any type that is generic in two parameters can be written either prefix form, which we're all used to, or infix form. Um, you can use it as like an operator. So like we could do it with maps, right? Like a regular old Scala collection map um, from int to string, we could write typewise as int map string everywhere in Scala. Anywhere you could have written map bracket int comma string, you can also write it that way. It'll compile fine. Um, things like IntelliJ should be fine, Eclipse should be fine, um, all of those should be cool. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's just a, a feature of the Scala syntax. Um, the second example here, or, uh, has anybody used um, like Scala test? Um, Scala test has like its companion library, Scalactic, yeah. and Scalactic defines this type or. It's like a nice version of either. Um, either in the shared library is kind of annoying, right? In that, like, it's completely unbiased, so like, it's kind of hard to use in four comprehensions, or at least annoying to use in four comprehensions. Yeah, it's not right biased, or is, or is right biased, or or um, has some very nice properties. Um, so if you've never seen Scalactic or, um, and you're interested in functional error handling, take a look. Docs are really, really good. Too. Yeah, Bill's awesome. <laughs> um, Bill's docs are awesome. Um, the third example is like Scala Z's disjunction. I use Scala Z's disjunction a lot. I, I really like that type. Um, I really dislike this name. Um, <laughs> like, and to make matters worse, like if you go to like contribute to Scala Z or you want to read the source code, 
it's not in disjunction.scala, and it's certainly not in that thing.scala, because how many times would you accidentally delete your disk trying to type that file name? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's in like either.scala, which is even more confusing because then it's, it's got support for regular ethers. It's like wacky. But you, but in any way, you know, using that data type, you can write int or, right, like v string, like logical connective or, right? It's kind of silly. Um, and I should point out, because it's Scala Z, that you can also use the Unicode symbol for or, like if you have a fancy keyboard or, um, anyway. But then we get to like H lists. Um, and like in our example from the last slide, where we had like int, 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 h nil, it was printed in this um, right nested uh, prefix form. So like here's just like two element list of int string h nil. Um, again, it's right nested. H lists are always right nested. Um, at least when you build them with our cons method that we created. Um, and we can kind of like, you know, piecemeal convert the types to infix form. So my first example on the right here, I've just taken that inner cons of string one to h nil and written it infix. And now I've got um, this bigger type of like cons int and then string h nil and I can write that infix and get this bigger thing. And there's no ambiguity here between left nesting and right nesting. Let alone like if I've got like lots of, of elements, if I've got like 20 elements, you know, all of the various sub pairings you could do. There's no ambiguity because Scala's got another beautiful feature which says if a method name or type name ends in a colon, the associativity is switched, right? Which feels like completely arbitrary and I'm pretty sure, I don't know this for a fact, but I'm pretty sure Martin put that in the language just to make cons work. Um, <laughs> I'm, but, per, I'm pretty sure that's the case. Yeah. <laughs> you, can also, um, you can also see this in the collections library. Uh, for those of you who haven't looked, look up and try to understand the difference between, on any given collection, plus colon mm -hmm. and colon plus. <laughs> yep. Yeah, have fun with that. <laughs> yeah, and it's like the same thing. Here, here it's just that, you know, the colon, you know, method or type that ends in colon ends up being right associative, so it actually gets parsed kind of right to left, you know. Notation-wise, we end up with this right-nested structure. So anyway, it's a really neat um, use of this both type operator and associativity um, that, that we can have in Shapeless. Is, is there a similar uh, syntax for if you don't want it right associative? Like, let's say you had uh, an h list where the first element was an h list of in string h nil. Yeah, <laughs> uh, there is not. I mean, okay. parens. So like parens will work in this, but yeah, like you have to put parens on your types, and mm -hmm. yeah, you'll see that sometimes in, in S codec where we'll we'll work with like really weird H list shapes, and you have those exact issues. Um, you know, I'm kind of my, my takeaway here on type operators is that like you can get end up with these really wacky um, types, like like just the simple case of one two three H nil, that when you get that type from a compiler error message or in the IDE or whatever is is maybe overwhelming. Um, but you can always just kind of like piecemeal do this mechanical transformation of switching prefix types into infix types and you can get to something that maybe makes more sense in that like this val x's is just type, you know, int cons int cons int cons nil. Um, there is no reason like we should have to do this as programmers, right? Like th this is something that the computer should do for us. Uh, hopefully we, it will. Um, it's been discussed a lot, both on Scala internals as well as type level Scala. Um, uh, about a year ago, there was a mailing list thread on Scala internals that was like, um, like one 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 philosophy is that if the type is a uh, not a word, but rather is a symbol, let's just assume it's infix. And in all compiler error messages, um, you know, types annotated in the REPL or in IDEs, everywhere they would just render infix. So you would just get that last line automatically for free. So that's cool for cons, right, for H lists, but it doesn't help like or. And in fact, it like encourages that goofy Scala Z V name, right? Because like, well, I could name it or, but then I'm going to get this weird infix notation. Let's let's name it a symbol instead. So anyway, but it's it's a pretty good like heuristic. Like in general, if it's a symbol, you probably want to infix, and in general, if it's name, you probably want to prefix. Maybe we can control it with an annotation. Right, that like if you don't like the defaults, just annotate your type like, hey, this should be infix syntax, and then the compiler would render it that way. So that's what's written up at this type level Scala issue. We hope to like prototype it there, um, hopefully get something that works, and then be able to PR it into mainline Scala. But um, anyway, future stuff there. All right, so let's do a bunch more H list examples. Um, 
has anybody been bitten by this first case? I have the integer 1 I'm going to put on top of a, a string, on top of an integer, and I get back a list of any, right? Because it, given our definition of, of cons, right, it said, like, you can, you can append any super type of this list. And, like, three, three cons nil is a list of any. And, well, can I cons a string onto a list of int? String's not a super type of, of that, right? But we can do, like, the compiler does this, like, least upper bound check and says, well, three could be considered an any. And an any is certain, I'm sorry, the string hello can be considered an any. And an any is certainly a super type of int. And therefore, yes, I can put a string on top of a list of int, right? And so we get this really wacky return type. Now, maybe this should be considered a bug or design inconvenience in the language, right? Maybe we should be able to tell the Scala compiler, um, you can take any type here for the cons method, but don't infer any, please, right? And in general, this is the idea of like, anytime you're inferring any, it's probably wrong. And so there's like, you know, ways to disable that. Um, I think there's a dash Y option in Scala 2.11 where you can disable any inference, but, but don't quote me on that. Um, and there's certainly issues in type level Scala for disabling uh, inference of any. But anyway, um, doing the same example with it with a heterogeneous list, you can see you know it's just par for the course. Not, nothing nothing fancy happens um, because we're tracking the type of of every individual element. So let me let me throw a clarification here if you don't mind. Yeah. So if you have an option on the compiler that disables any inference, mm -hmm. you still have a difference then between an H list and a regular list because what will happen then is if you dis disable that inference, the top one becomes a compiler error. Right. But you, that's not the case in the bottom one. Right, exactly. I just wanted to clarify that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, like the top case, you know, often when something like this occurs, it's a bug, right? It's a mistake. Like we changed a type and we forgot somewhere. We didn't, you know, fix it in this one case. And we get this weird list of any. Um, it's why, like, a lot of people propose coding styles that require, like, every vowel to be explicitly annotated with a return type, right? Whether or not that's good or bad, you know, is, is probably an argument for a coding standards body. But um, nonetheless, uh, you know, it's interesting that we're applying like discipline to programmers because of uh, the side effect in the way type inference works. Um, the bottom one is most certainly not a bug, right? The bottom one is the prime feature we're getting with HLIST here in the sense that we can combine um, an arbitrary set of types and remember the type of each position, remember how many positions are in my list. Um, and we can use that stuff statically. All right, because our con cell is just a case class with a head of type H and a tail of type T, or T is another H list, um, we can just call those accessors, right? So there's no magic here. There's no additional code here. This is using the same basic data structure we've looked at so far. Um, but we can ask for, like, the head of X's. And we get back the value 1, but the type that we get back is int, right? We can ask for the tail, and we get back another H list shape. We can ask for the head of the tail. We get back a string, right? We're just traversing that case class. So, so nothing fancy, no implicit magic, right? No compiler magic. We're just traversing our, our basic case class. Um, we could ask for the head of the tails, tails, tail, right? So if we have a three element H list, we do the tails, tails, tail, we're at the H nil. And now we call dot head on it. And we get this really weird error message. Like you'd think you'd get an error message that would say this method head doesn't exist on H nil. And that's what you maybe sort of should get. Um, and like when we were calling like x's.head and x's.tail.head, it really was just calling the normal accessor method that's generated by the Scala compiler for case classes. Nothing fancy. What happens here is that it gets down to like tail, tail, tail head. The Scala compiler says, well, hnil doesn't have a head method on it. So do I have any implicits in scope, right? If it's not underscore, it's implicits always with Scala, right? So do I have any implicits in scope that could add a head method to an H nil? And it just what happens in shapeless there is, and it's not really important what this thing is. But the, the, the method that like adds, that, that kind of decorates an H nil with a head method requires this other thing. So we get like this wacky compiler error message saying like, well, you can't call head because you don't have an is H cons. And like the name's kind of interesting, is that like you can call head if the thing you're calling it on is an H con cell, is a con cell. So it sort of makes sense, but it's still weird, right? Like it's not the error message I would have expected. 
And of course, the type of that last thing. This is using like REPL syntax. Everybody ever seen that like colon T thing at the REPL, right? You can ask for the type of something. So at the REPL, we're saying, what's the type of our tails, tails, tail? And it says it's it's literally type shapeless.html. Okay, so how do we map over these things? It's like the first thing we want to do with a list, right? Maybe we map over and convert every integer to a string. Um, let's look at how we would, might map over a um, H list. Um, bad news is that it's wildly different, um, right? Because normally when I'm working like mapping over a list, we know that every element in the list is like an int. And so now we need like this monomorphic function, a function that says take an input of type int and convert it to something else, right? Some other type, some output type. But with H lists, we've got all sorts of different types all throughout our H list. And we need to define like cases to say like, if you encounter an integer, then here's the code I want you to run. If you encounter something else, here's some other code I want you to run. So um, in, in shapeless, we do it this way. Um, so we have our X is H list, um, int string int. And we're going to define an object to represent our function. Like so a regular old Scala object. And we're going to extend this shapeless type called poly1. Poly is short for like polymorphic function. It's the idea that we can vary over types. Right? And then what we're going to define is um, we're basically going to kind of like type level pattern match almost. I mean, not really like pattern match in the sense of like the Scala match keyword, but rather we're going to use this like at method on the right hand side to say like as you traverse the structure of the H list, when you see an integer, then here's a function to use to, to, to deal with that integer. So convert any integer you see to the result of that value plus one. Um, and like, and I, I meant to correct the bolding here, but the default thing is not like a new Scala keyword, right? It's just a random method name. Um, the syntax highlighter just highlighted that for whatever reason as a keyword. Um, but our default case just says like, if you encounter any other type in the world, right, any type A, then just return it, right? We're just using the identity function on that, that right hand side. So um, quick question. Mm -hmm. There is, uh, and I know the answer to this one, uh, but shapeless does not, re the names of these implicit are, methods are completely irrelevant. Yes. But I'm betting that the use of default is a common shapeless uh, convention. Yes. To indicate the default case. Yep. But how shapeless picks up the default is the type parameter. Correct. Yeah. I mean, so really, and we'll see some examples of that in a minute, um, we have to make sure that our poly1 uh, has, a, has a case defined for every type in our H list. So in this case, our H list had an int and a string in it. Right? I mean, it was, an, it was int string in, but so the set of types it, it deals with is an int and string. And so we have to make sure both int and string are covered. We certainly have int covered in the first case. We have string covered in the second case. There's some magic here with shapeless in that like I define both of these as like implicit defs, and yet I'm not going to get like some weird ambiguousness. Like if I ask for int, technically both of these match, right? Like the so second one could certainly match an integer, but shapeless is going to handle that for us. And I'm pretty sure it's defined in order, like the first one that, that appears. But and, and like, right, if we map ink over it, then the object ink, we get our value two hello four instead of one hello three. So like if we do the same thing, but we're going to get rid of our default case, just delete it, and add a case for strings, um, where we're going to do like at string, just reverse the string, then we get the same thing, but our string has been reversed. Um, and like, so this just shows like you don't need a default case, right? As long as you've covered all of types. It doesn't have to be one to one, right? So you could cover like 25 types and only need three of them. Um, but as long as everything in the H list, every type in the H list has a case that matches it, you're cool. You can map it. Um, so what happens if we don't, right? Um, so it's like a skill you need when working with shapeless is to learn how to decipher compiler error messages into what's actually wrong and not what it's telling you, right? In this case, like I don't have a string case and it says could not find an implicit value for parameter mapper of type some crazy thing. Um, and really like we're gonna, we're gonna now try to attempt to understand like what these error messages are really saying. Like what's this mapper thing? Where's it coming from? Um, what does all that mean? But the kind of the important point here is not understanding this error message at this point, but rather that we get a compile error, right? If we don't, if we try to map a function or a polymorphic function across an H list, we haven't defined every type. It's a compile error, not a runtime error. So, like, if you did all of this at the value level, you'd be working with a list of any, and in your map function, you would be using a regular like this mat or you know value match um, 
you know, brace, and then you define each one of your cases and do like runtime type checks or something. And then deal with all the wackiness of like, well, I don't have a type tag in this case, and so, ugh. Okay. Um, but before we, we look at those error messages, I want to do a couple other things. Um, one is take and drop, right? So two other very common things we can do in lists. So we start with the same list, one hello three, and I want to take the first two elements from it. I get back a list of just one hello nil. Um, and again, the type has been modified correctly. Our return type here of, of y's, the type of y's is int uh, cons string cons h nil. So I was able to take the first two things off and forget the rest of the types. Drop works just as well. If I drop the first two things off, I get a, a singleton a, um, h list back, um, just int cons h nil. So this is cool. We can say take four from a three element list and we get a compile error. Um, so this is pretty neat, um, and we're not going to talk about all the things that make this work today. Um, in order to do this, not only do we need to figure out what, what these weird error messages um, are trying to say to us, but we also need to, you know, need some way to like take one of these numbers, you know, two and four in this case, and like lift the number into the type system and have a type that represents the number four. And Shapeless does all that. <laughs> um, I'm not talking about Shapeless it today. Has that as a feature? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I, you can see dollar macro in there. Because I <laughs> yeah. Because I've been searching for the ability to like in C plus plus you could pass integers in as, as template numbers. Yes. And you couldn't do you can't do that in Scala without reifying right. one as a type, which felt to me pretty ghetto. Yeah. So, so we there. can. It so, is. Yes. <laughs> um, and I'm going to talk about it a little bit, but I'm not going to do the specifics. I mean, so like there's a there's a neat way you could define it where you could say like zero is some value like z, like z type z, right? Um, or trait z or something. And then you could define like a successor type, right? And just do it like with Pinot arithmetic or like Pinot numbers. So like three is really like the successor of the successor of the successor of zero. You can do it that way. And like I think an old version of Shapeless did it that way, but like... By the time you get to like a list of like 20 elements, like your computer sets on fire, like if you try to compile, right? Um, that's not the way Shapeless does it today. It does it in a much neater way. And this feature specifically of like taking a literal number four and lifting it to the type system, to the type level, we went from the value four to the type four, sort of, um, is, is really awesome. It is something that, that um, I mean, you can see it's sort of macro supported here, but, but uh, is, is unique to Shapeless. Okay. So we'll talk about that in a minute. So it's interesting then if you say val n equals four. Yes. That's a different story. Yes. And there are ways of working with that, but yes. Yes. Um, so I'm only, I'm only going to hint at some of that stuff, but feel free to contact me if you're interested. All right. Um, so unification. So I think this is the toughest part of the talk today, this unification topic. Um, at least th this idea itself is not um, unfamiliar. Um, in this case, I have a sealed trait parent. It's going to extend product with serializable, which is sort of a weird definition, but like if you define an ADT in Scala of like a, a, a sealed trait and a bunch of like case classes that implement it, right? Um, add extends product with serializable. Like if you want to do it now, go ahead, I'll wait. Like it's super <laughs> important. Um, because if you don't do that, like, and what do I care whether this thing's serializable? Like, why would I use Java serializability, right? If you don't do that, and you just said like a regular old Scala list, forget all this shapeless stuff. You just said like val x's equals a list of foo, bar, and baz. It's not inferred as a list of parent, which is what you want, right? Instead, it's inferred as the least upper bound of all the list arguments. So what's the least upper bound of a foo and a bar and a baz? Well, parent certainly an upper bound, but foo, because it's a case class, specifically that's a case class, right? is both a product, which is like this kind of weird trait in Scala that like lets you iterate over all of the elements of the case class as any's. Like it gives you like an iterator of any. And it's also serializable because all case classes are serializable. And you know, this case object bar, or I'm sorry, the case object baz is the same way. So anyway, the most specific, the least upper bound of my three types is parent with product with serializable. Like you might have seen error messages like this. We get this random with product serializable in the output and it makes things not compile. So if you can, you can fix it. You can work around it by just sticking it on parent. If you say parent is extending product with serializable, then when the inference kicks in, the inferencer will say, oh yeah, okay, parent's definitely the, the most specific type, the least upper bound of these three types. Right? So it's a little trick in ADT design. Okay, but now that we have that, 
Um, we'll define x's as an h nil, not as a regular list, or sorry, as an h list, not as a regular list. Um, and like, okay, well, we can call two lists. It converts our heterogeneous list to a list of, um, of, of, of like a regular Scala collection immutable list. Now, in order to do that, we've got to take all of those type parameters and unify them to the least upper bound type of them, right? So it's going to say, well, you've got a foo on top of a bar on top of a baz. What's the least upper bound? Well, in this case, it's parent. So I can give you back a list of parent. If we had done our example of like one or int string int, we would have gotten back a list of any, right? Um, so unify is a method that comes, or is that's provided by shapeless, which is kind of like halfway to two list, right? Um, in that, like, it does the least upper bound calculation, but it maintains the structure of the H list. So we're going to lift all the types to the least upper bound of all of the elements, but we're going to keep the same number of elements. So here we know, by, by unifying this X's list, we know that we have an H list of three elements and that each element is a parent. But we've lost the detailed information that the first element was a foo and the second element was a bar, right? So forget why you might want to do this. I mean, you can invent reasons, and I could have made some stuff up here. Um, but I want to look at how Unify is implemented in Shapeless because, and like I said, this is the most complicated part of the talk today, but I think there's some neat things, there's some neat patterns you, you'll see as we go through this example um, that you're going to see again and again when working with um, type level programming in Scala. Now keep in mind, like I didn't, I didn't hide anything in our definition of HList. Um, like, let's look at hlist in Scala. I mean, sorry, in, um, oh, I have it open. In, um, in shapeless. That's the whole definition, right? Like, I, when I said, like, um, this was a skeleton of an hlist, uh, we're not going to add any methods at all to our sealed trade hlist. This is important. Um, never. Like, you know, this is the production definition. It, you know, it has product with serializable, so we get nice inference, but there's nothing else added whatsoever. So instead of adding methods, we're going to put a bunch of different patterns together. Um, we're going to use an implicit class. Has anybody used implicit classes? All right, let's just like add extension methods effectively to, to objects, right? And what we're going to do is add an extension method called unify to some type L, where L is a subtype of hlist. Because our cons class like subtyped hlist, um, L can be any of, of these of these hlist shapes we've been creating, right? Um, and the neat thing about defining it this way is that we've captured in L, like if someone tries to say, I've got some hlist type and I'm going to call it unify on it, the compiler is going to bind the shape, the type of that, that list to our L parameter. And we've captured it in, the, in sort of a variable almost, and we can manipulate it. All right, so we're going to define our, our method unify now and say, okay, well, on any hlist, we can have a unify method. As long as you've got an implicit unifier for, for list L. It's like, what the heck is this implicit unifier, right? Um, I'm going to call that today a um, type operation. And the idea of a type operation is on the bottom part of the slide. Um, we're going to encode the behavior that we want to, to, to um, apply to our list as a sealed trait um, and an object. The sealed trait is going to have at least one like regular method on it that does what we want. In this case, it's apply. So um, this, this trait's kind of interesting that it takes, you know, it, it can unify a list, of, uh, an H list of shape L, which is going to be a type parameter, and it can unify it into another list of shape out. We're not going to define out as a type parameter. We're going to define it as an abstract type member, which is kind of important, but, but um, don't want to worry about it yet. So we're just defining it abstractly. So whoever subtypes our unifier trait is going to have to specify what out's equal to. And that's it. Like that's all we're going to tell you about unifier is that um, you know that's the full definition of unifier in that we've got one abstract type parameter, um, type member, and one abstract method apply. And now in the companion object, we're going to take advantage of the fact that when Scala goes to look for a unifier instance of L in implicit scope, it's always going to go look in the companion of the trait it's looking for, right? So it's going to say, well, go to the companion of unifier and see if I can find an implicit unifier for this this shape L where L is whatever hlist I called the method on, right? So we're basically going to prove, like in, in a formal sense, we're going to prove um, that this is a safe method to call by uh, induction on the structure of the hlist. 
Um, so here's what I mean by that. Um, let's, let's look at the implicit def first. Let's not look at the aux thing for a moment. We're going to define base cases in our proof, right? It's a proof by induction. We're going to say, well, what do we do? How do we unify an empty H list? I mean, so if it's an empty H list, then the output type is just going to be another empty H list. There's nothing to unify. So that one's easy in a sense. So we're going to define that case as an implicit method so that when the compiler comes here and says, find me a unifier for H nil, it's going to find this guy. And it's going to say the input type is H nil. Now we've got this weird aux thing I'll talk about in a second. But let's look at the body. It says, just create a, an anonymous instance of our unifier trait, set the output type to H nil. And when we are applied with an empty list, just return the empty list. Right? Very, very um, straightforward base case. So what the heck is this aux thing? So aux will define as a um, type member or type alias in the unifier companion. And it's going to lift our abstract type member to a type parameter. Right? So like. It's, a, it's aux of L and out is an alias for the structural refinement type of unifier where type out is fixed to out zero. Like, Clearly. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so bear with me, right? But it basically all it lets us do is talk about a unifier with a specific output. That's the key idea. So then the idea here is that, well, if you unify the H nil list, then the output's going to be H nil. And we can talk about that as the return type of our method. OK, so now for our one element list, unification is also easy. We don't know its type, right? We don't, I mean, we don't, we don't know the, the type, um, like whether it's an integer or a string in our singleton list. But we can capture that just as a type variable h, you know, type parameter to this method for one. And we can say, like, well, we'll provide you a proof that says if you have a singleton list, if your input is h on top of h now, right, statically, then your output is also going to be h on top of h nil, because unifying a singleton list is just that type. All right, so then the cool part comes in. We get to the inductive case. And I'm not going to go through every bit of this, but the notion of it is this. Um, we're going to define this inductively on this input shape here, right in the middle. We're going to say if you've got a head 1 on top of a head 2 on top of some other tail, maybe an h nil, maybe a really long remainder list, right? But the point is we have two elements then we can provide you back out, we can provide you a unifier that gives you an, the least upper bound of h1 with the least upper, or sorry, the least upper bound between h1 in the first position, the least upper bound between h1 and h2 in the second position, and then the rest. And the rest will be defined inductively. Like we're going to call ourselves recursively in a sense, but at the type level via implicits. So, so the, generally it works like this. We're going to get this lub value. Lub is a shapeless type operator, another type operator, unrelated to the one we're defining. Um, lub takes three types, two input types and one output type, kind of. Um, I mean, it takes three types, right? But there's no such thing as like in and out types. But we're kind of cheating the way Scala does implicit resolution to, to, to treat it that way. Has anyone ever done like prolog or datomic um, with, with closure? Um, any type of logic programming? Like this is the type of stuff you do there, right? Um, where we're defining these variables and then like asking the system to find some set of values that can that satisfy all these different constraints. So here we're saying find an h1 and an h2 and an h lub. Now h1 and h2 we know are input types um, because of our input here we said is h1 h2 t. And this lub type operator is only going to be defined such that it gives you back a lub for an h1 h2 where the third type is set to the least upper bound of h1 and h2. So if we came at this with like a foo and a bar, we're going to get like a parent in h lub position. And then the recursive step is we're going to say unify the remainder of the list where we forget about h1. We take the lifted version of h2, the, the h lub for the h2 position and the rest, unify that, and only put, you know, put our h1 back on, on the end when we're, when we're finished. So like the rest of the implementations here, and like um, you go through it in detail, it's like, this left method is lifting the h1 to the parent lub. Um, this right method is taking the second element and lifting it to, to the parent. And then we unify. We call ourselves recursively at the value level as well. right? Um, but that's the general idea is that we're, in, we're, we're actually using induction on our structure. Um, and we're defining 
this implicit parameter block where the compiler is, is going and calculating all of these additional uh, constraints on our types. So we're using type parameters as variables and we're using implicit parameters as constraints on those variables. That's the idea. Sort of makes sense, like not, don't worry about every line here in the syntax, but that idea of like, of using parameters and constraints sort of makes sense, because we're gonna see that um, here in a moment. This pattern is like essential to understanding shapeless source code, and essential to understanding the error message we were getting, right? When we got an error message saying I like, couldn't find mapper for some wacky type, it was saying like I, I couldn't go through with all of my implicit definitions on how to generate a mapper, I couldn't find any that made sense. Like, I, you know, based off the types you gave me, those don't solve is basically what I was saying. Uh, and typically you see it like this, a sealed trait, input and output types, right? Some level, you know, whether they be methods or some, some encoding that actually does the behavior you want. In our case, it was unifying our list. Um, almost always in the companion objects, you're gonna have this aux type, at least in shapeless, that takes any abstract type members and lift them up to type parameters. Uh, you'll see some more examples in that in a minute. Um, and then you'll probably have Maybe some base cases, maybe some inductive cases. Some proofs are so simple, you only need an inductive case, right? Um, some proofs you actually need base cases, whatever. But this, these really are proofs, right? We are, we are using the Scala compiler as a proof assistant. So what do I mean by that? Like, there are awesome proof assistants that exist, right? Scala C is not one of them. <laughs> um, like, and a very simple example is, like, you take the exact code from the last slide, but, like, trust me, it compiles and works. <laughs> um, you take that, that code from the last slide and you just swap the order of our two implicit parameters. You just move tail unifier and lub into different positions. That should not change anything, right? Like same variables, same constraints does not compile. I mean, well, it compiles, but at runtime it'll never find, for any interesting H list, it's never gonna find a unifier instance that satisfies it. We're gonna get one of those like cannot find implicit unifier, blah, blah, blah. Like, and why? Well, in this case, it happens to be because we asked for a unifier before we asked for a lug. Compiler, Scala C's like implicit resolution algorithm infers things left to right. And so it's gonna say, okay, when it gets time to, uni um, to, to calculate the unifier, what's hlub? Well, like, we don't know what hlub is at all, right? All we know at this point is that hlub is a type parameter to our method. And now there's a first time it appears in our, in our um, rest of our uh, method signature we're asking Scala C to go off and unify it. So Scala C knows nothing about it. It's going to say, well, hlub is nothing at this point. So can I find an implicit unifier for nothing on top of T? And it's going to fail, and then we get some wacky error message. We need it to first do the lub to like solve for the output parameter hlub, so that by the time it gets to the next line, it can say, find a unifier of parent on top of T. So like things like this are wacky, right? You shouldn't have to do this. Um, on the left is Adrian Moores. Uh, lead compiler engineer uh, at TypeSafe, right? Uh, he says, despite y'all's best efforts, Scala is not a proof assistant, sorry. Miles Sabin, or Miles Sabin, um, author of Shapeless, says it is a proof assistant, just not a very good one. Um, and I thought this was a very fun exchange. Um, because it's true, like, in order to make effective use of these kind of like these, this proof system or, or proving things inductively with, with implicits, you've got to worry about all this stuff. And I had a case in H, I'm sorry, I had a case in S codec where there's like this complicated type operator that used the, this same pattern. And like in all the examples, it worked fine. And then I had a couple of reports, like I, um, Steve didn't make it tonight, but Steve Buzzard for the folks that know him. Steve had told me like, hey, by the way, I got this one structure and like the compilation like went from whatever, a few seconds to like 30 seconds after upgrading. Um, and then I had someone else say it on the mailing list. And I, you know, at one point I looked into it and it was something like this. Like where it ended up actually working in the end, but because of like the way implicit search was occurring, like it was for, for non-trivial structures, it was making compilation times through the roof. And we were able to like just change a couple slight things about the definition of the implicit um, inductive cases and boom, compilations like back to, to, to nice and speedy. So anyway, you shouldn't have to worry about these things, but like shapeless is sort of like abusing what you should be doing with Scala. <laughs> but it's cool because Miles did it and we can use it. All right. <laughs> Here's a simple example of abstracting over each list, right? I want to write a method that squares all integers in my list. This is super simple with like a list of any, right? Map over it, pattern match on int, square it. All right, so let's do it with, with h lists. So we start with this. Let's take an h list as an input and an h list as an output. Um, first problem is that sealed trade h list, we, don't, we know nothing. It could be an h nil, it could be some complicated wacky shape, it could be a singleton list, and there are no methods. So not only on the input side here, there's nothing we can do, 
But on the output side, whoever we return this to, they can't do anything with what we're returning, right? At least without downcasting, which is bad, right? Um, okay, so this isn't going to work. Um, let's use our same trick we used from HList Ops. We're going to capture our shape, right? And say, well, you give us, give me an HList of some type L. I don't know what it is, but you give it to me. And I'll give you back one with the same shape. All I'm going to do is replace every number with its square. Um, now we can use our poly trick. Right? We've seen poly ones before, just regularly mapping over a list. So we're going to define a bunch of cases. We'll say like at each one of these integer types, I didn't do like shorts and bytes and characters, whatever, but at int long float and double, we'll just square, and at everything else, we'll just return identity, right? Just return the value. Okay, this looks so, so far so good. We compile and we get an error. Now, had we done this at the REPL without defining the square method, but just like mapping the square object over like a known hless shape, it would have worked fine. But here we've lost information, right? Like when we were mapping it over like a known like int string int, the compiler knew it's an int string int. But here the compiler only knows you've got an L. It's better than saying I just got an H list, but we don't know like what, anything about L, so we can't necessarily map it. Okay, but we just learned a little bit in the unify example of the way that's working. It's saying, well, in order to map, it needs this like proof that it's safe to map. So like in this case, the mapper type operator is going to take two parameters. One is like the, the type of the polymorphic function. And here we're seeing sq.type, right? We're seeing the singleton type that references that object defined above and the, the input shape of the list. And so we can just ask for it. And like this is generally how you program with shapeless is like you get an error message like that you say oh okay and you add it as an implicit parameter right and like i don't know what it's asking me for i'm just going to add it as an implicit parameter and see if it compiles um and this will compile well almost now we get an error message saying like map is safe but the result of mapping square over l has type m dot out but we need you're claiming to return l so there are two ways to solve this. One is we can just lie, or we can just get rid of like the return type L, like literally delete colon L from the name of our, our, our method definition, right? And some people that use shapeless absolutely do it this way. Um, like I, there's a Stack Overflow with I was learning shapeless. You can go Google it and see an S codec where I was stuck on an example like this, so I just deleted the output thing there, and it was good enough in my case. Um, and that works because of type inference. Right. Um, it works fine. Just to make that clear. Yeah, now, as long as the person who's calling us is not also working with generic shapes, right? But if they know they've got an in string int, everything just works. Okay, but but in our APIs, we want to be clear, especially when, like, you start writing some of these abstract methods, you've got all these wacky type operators, implicits. Like, it's better to say, like, you're going to get back L, right? Like, And so how can we do it? Well, we can structurally refine our mapper type and say, like, we're only interested in an implicit mapper whose output type is equal to L. We're going to like, this structural refinement is, is a c additional constraint we're going to put on the implicit resolution of mapper. And maybe you, maybe you remember that this notion of binding output parameters, uh, we, we codified in our aux type alias. And this is why we define these. So we can actually bind them directly in these signatures. Now you never have to, you can always write this way. But as you have, you've got a lot of these type operators, this gets really noisy. This is much less noisy. Um, but anyway, you know, this is this is the, the working definition of this um, function. Okay. Um, so let's start putting pieces together. Case classes. Case classes we can represent um, generically as an H list of their element types. Okay. So here I've got a car, I've got make, model, and year fields. I could convert that to an H list, and I have an H list of three elements where the first element's a make, the second's a model, the third's a year. Um, it'd be nice if Shapeless provided us machinery to go to and from these representations, right? The generic representation of my car being those three types in an H list, and my full um, nice to work with implementation in my car class. So in Shapeless, we do that with this generic type. This is the full API of generic in, in the sense of the trait. So generic of type T has some abstract type member called repr, which is like the generic representation. And then to and from methods, just convert. Okay. Um, here's how you use it. Um, so I'm going to, on this third line here, I'm going to summon a generic car instance. Now I'm not going to type 
this value. This is important. I'm not going to say like generic car has type generic car because I'm going to lose that refinement of the output, or I'm sorry, of the repr type. And you can see my return type here is not a generic car, rather it's a very specific generic car. It's the generic car with the refinement where the type repr is actually equal to make on top of model on top of year. Okay, so that's important. And it's commonly, like I screw this up all the time. It's a, it's a common mistake when using shapeless is you accidentally lose a refinement type. Had I asked for like implicitly generic car, like the, the, the I use the implicitly method to summon it, I, it would not work. Um, shapeless has an equivalent of implicitly that preserves refinement types called the. So I could say the generic car and that would be the same as this code. But, but anyway, okay, so we've got a generic car. Usage is a lot easier than, than explaining it, right? Um, I say give me a generic car and then convert my car case class into an H list. That's X. And then um, take the tail but stick make VW on the front and now I've got a much cheaper Tesla. Right? I drive a VW, by the way. Okay. Um, so um, here's the implementation of generic. I, I only included this slide because I thought it was really cool. This is the whole implementation. Every line of generic is on the slide. Um, you can see it has an aux. So like anytime we want to like bind to the output representation in like an implicit parameter block, we can use that aux thing. We've got an imply, uh, an imply method. Like we used that in the last slide when we said give me a generic car. But you can see all it's really doing is like summoning a generic instance via an implicit parameter block, right? It just says like apply requires an implicit generic T and I'm just going to return you that same generic T. And then we're using a feature of macro paradise. Um, so like macros aren't bleeding edge enough. We actually want to go a step further and use a, an experimental experiment and pull in macro paradise. And anyway, like that's what this materialized thing is. It says anytime someone asks for a, uh, asks for a generic I'm sorry, ask for an implicit generic X, get it from calling this method at compile time. And it's backed by a, a special macro called an implicit macro. And anyway, and like all of the magic is in here. This is Shapeless's key macro. Like all of the genius um, is in this macro. It's, it's beautiful. Okay. Um, moving on, uh, we have records. Uh, records, generically, we're just going to say a record is a way to take an H list, but like apply a key to each value. So like rather than saying like give me the second element, I could say give me the model of my car, right? Um, the, the type encoding in Shapeless is kind of interesting. It's actually just an H list. Like so records are H lists. Remember what I said earlier about like John DeGoz's statement of like um, the number of types a library introduces, right? Um, in this case, we're able to encode records as just another type of H list, a special type of H list. Um, so it's an H list where every um, element in the H list is a field type KV. K is going to be like the, the index, the thing I use to look up into my record. You know, it's going to say, go get me the field named model, or get me the field named year. And V is going to be like the actual value type. It's, it's an int or a string or a model or whatever. Um, it's implemented in this really interesting way. Um, like you can see a field type is an alias for like V with key tag KV. And key tag KV is just a trait. Like there's no implementation to that trait. It's just like this standalone trait. The important thing about this is that records are compile time construct only. At runtime, the with everything else erases. Right? Like due to erasure, at runtime, a record is exactly the same as an H list with just the value types in it. So there's no overhead to records at runtime. Um, there's not really significant overhead to using H lists at runtime either, right? They were just con cells. Um, so like all, all the type of performance analysis you do for like a regular list applies to H list. But this is a really neat implementation of shapeless records where the keys erase. So don't, so don't worry too much about that field type definition. Um, the other thing we're going to do is our keys are going to be singleton types. So we've already seen singleton types a few times, right? Like we saw every object has a singleton type that refers to it. Um, well, it turns out like values have singleton types too. So like Joe had mentioned earlier about like actually like grabbing integers and like using them at, at the type level. Turns out in Scala that exists. It's just just below the surface. Sometimes it bleeds out in error messages, but like the number 23 has a type associated with it, and that's its type, in paren 23. 
And if you had a, like a, a var of type int 23, and you tried to assign to it 24, it'd be a compile error. But yeah. <laughs> but like syntax-wise, it's hidden. You can't define a var of type int 23. But if you start working with like macros or Scala reflection or Scala meta, you run into these singleton types. So like they exist in Scala, they exist in the language, but they're just syntax-wise, they're just like one just just hidden from us. So so um, shapeless actually lets us into that through macros. There's a way to access these singleton types. Um, also, Scala 2.12, um, it's very likely that this will be added. So in Scala 2.12, it's very likely that like at the REPL, you'll be able to type 23.type and get back the singleton type that refers to that value. OK, so let's see a usage of records. What the heck are they for? All right, so here is a record. Um, we're going to have make, model, and year. Um, and we're going to put them all on an H list. But to create like the key value structure, I just chose to use symbols as my keys. Like this is just Scala symbol syntax, right? So also you have to wonder like would that make it into the language today? But like 10 years ago when Scala was developed, like Ruby was really popular and Ruby had like the, I don't know, whatever they were called. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so maybe, maybe it wouldn't, maybe, maybe it would, I don't know. But, but here I'm using symbols, normal Scala language feature to represent like intern strings. Okay, so I say I'm going to map the make key to this value, make Tesla, and so on. And rather than using like the, just the tuple arrow operator, like normal arrow, we have an extra greater than because we're really certain we want a record, right? Like we don't just want a tuple, we want this record thing. Okay, so now with this definition, I can do this. I can say give me the make. Like I'm just going to call the apply method on car and say give me the make back. Now look at the return types of these. Like when I ask for the make and the model and the year, the return types are the static types of those entries. So I'm not getting like an any back, or I'm not getting like some super type or lub or, or whatever. I'm getting back their most specific type that they were defined with. Really cool. I can replace elements. So here I'll take our car and I'll say add to that a, um, a field that says map year to the year 2016. And now this plus method doesn't like cons a year onto the end of my H list. It actually says go through, add it if it doesn't exist. But if it does exist, replace that mapping with this new mapping. It's like the plus on a map. Right. Yeah, it's a good way to put it. Exactly. And then I try to do this. I say, well, give me the foo off of car. And I get back this crazy comp compilation message. Like, what is that type? Right? It's, it's crazy. Um, I don't want to go through the whole definition of that type because um, it's kind of complicated. It basically boils down to this. It's the field type thing. The interesting thing is that the key is symbol tagged with the singleton type for my string make. So like that's, that's how Miles chose to represent this. That's how all this magic works. Um, you know, it takes some time to kind of grok that. <laughs> um, the, point, the point is that, like, when using records, you get really scary error messages. Okay. All right. So can we put all these pieces together again? We're going to try to take records and say, like, well, we have already saw generic representations of case classes. But we forgot stuff when we did that. Like, when we projected the generic representation, we got make, model, and year, but we lost the names of the fields. We had the type names, but not the field names. So in Shapeless, we can do that. We can go between a case class and its record representation using this labeled generic uh, abstraction. So the trait is defined like this. Entire trait, every line of code. Right? So it's got the abstract repr type member and it's got the to and the from method. The implementation in the object, the, the, the companion object for labeled generic, is not a macro. This is really awesome. The implementation uses the generic macro and uses something called like default symbolic labeling, which it has a macro in it, which like basically can say like reflect at compile time, reflect over the structure of the car and pull out all the names and basically kind of almost like zips them together, if you will. The neat thing about that is one, um, macros are really hard to get right <laughs> and difficult. And so like the less macros, the better. But two, like you don't like the way these are labeled, you want to change the labeling scheme for something custom to your domain, you can, um, you can write your own uh, default symbolic or different symbolic labeling that, that can do that. So a bit of a complicated use case. But anyway, um, 
All right, so usage is the same, right? Here's our same car example. I asked for a labeled generic this time instead of a regular generic. And now I can convert to and from it. Now, that this is kind of interesting. This is a type-safe version of copy, right? From, from uh, I mean, not that copy's not type-safe, but it's copy's mm -hmm. kind of weird the way code generation works and that it generates like all these defaulted parameter blocks, right? Here, we can actually say like, we'll convert our car to the record representation and then replace the model field with a different model. We're gonna say, you know, replace it with model X and then go back to the label, uh, go back to the case class. And we get back a case class, right? So we've got a nice complicated version of copy. All right, so let's put all of the, the, this stuff together into a useful example. Anybody ever kind of wish they had this? Um, case classes by default don't print the labels out, like in the generated two string, right? So when I do like a two string one point, I just get like point one, two, three. And sometimes I want to see like point x is one, y is two, z is three, right? So here's a very simple way to do that, right? I just say like, I'm going to write this method called show point. It's going to convert a point to a string. We'll ask for the label generic representation of point and then convert our P, our point, into our record. Then we're going to ask shapeless, give us all the fields of that record, convert it to a list. And I've got a list of fields. Um, and it's at the value level. So I really have a list of tuples, right, of keys and values. And the keys at this point are symbols. So I can just do k.name to get the, the string out of the symbol. And then v, I'll just call the two string on v. And, you know, then just convert that list using the regular Scala collection make string. End of the day, I get a nice two string. So that's cool. Um, and there's like, there's dozens of issues about this in the Scala issue tracker. Like you go find all sorts of them. There's, there's open source projects that solve this problem. Um, typically with runtime reflection, which, I mean, I don't know. I, I've had a job where I had to go through and rip out all the uses of the commons lang reflection two string builder. I don't know if anyone's used that, but like something that actually does like runtime reflection on your Java objects to like render this kind of stuff. And like that was the hot spot in the application. And like hundreds of classes had to have that removed. Um, so this is kind of neat. It's all compiled time, right? But this is very boilerplate -y still because I have to define those four lines for every H list. So can we abstract over this definition the same way we abstract it over our square method? You can. It's a little bit harder, um, but let's walk through it. It's it's um, it's approachable if we, if we take it piece by piece. So the idea here is we're going to define show that's going to work on any type A, not just on points. Um, we're going to want to label generic for A. So we're going to be able to convert a case class into its record shape R. We're going to want to be able to get the fields out of R, and that's supported by this fields operator. So And it's going to give us the fields, the output of the fields operator is going to be uh, HList F. Um, and then we're going to be able to convert that H list F, our H list of all the fields, into a list of tuples of symbol and any, where the symbol is like the, the symbol, the key of the field, and the any is the value of the field. And so basically, this is just like that same application of like, take the code, compile it, like all we did is remove point out of it, right, and replace it with type parameter A, and then keep adding implicits to make shapeless happy, or to make the compiler happy. So, you know, basically this aux pattern of like, you can see the inputs A, the outputs R, but the, that's fed into the next operator, right, and so on, um, we get the same thing. The other cool thing here, the only other thing here is this typable. Typable is like a, uh, well, it's, it's basically used for type safe casting. Um, like if you have proof that you can downcast without casting, I mean, without causing a class cast exception, Shapeless would let you do that via typable. We're not using that in this case. Instead, we just want a nice name for our type. Like in our previous example, we just hard-coded point. But here, we don't know what type A is. Now, we could cheat and use Java reflection, right? We could take our input parameter A and call .get class, and then call .get simple name on it. Maybe that's not so bad. In fact, my first version of these slides had that in it. And then Miles said, hey, I just added this new feature a couple weeks ago um, called described typable. Um, and so anyway, like we can just say, give us a typable instance for some type A, and that's going to give us back a nice name for it in a static way without runtime reflection. So anyway, the point is that when we show point, we get the same output. Okay, but what if we did something like this, case class foo? Now, if we did our, our kind of Java reflection naive approach of, of get class dot get simple name, we would get back foo. 
But here, we get back foo of int. Because shapeless can, when it materializes the typable instance for foo of int, it's doing it at static compilation time. We're not doing runtime reflection, so we're not bitten by erasure. So I think this is really neat. This is, um, this is a cool feature. So anyway, like this slide like invalidates plenty of open source projects. Don't need it if you use shapeless, right? Um, I think it's, it's a really neat feature of um, shapeless. Sounds like show auto actually being, it looks like it's generic enough you could just even code it in shapeless. Yeah, it absolutely could be. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, something that I, sh I should know the answer to, it's just that I'm not very oh, educated please. on shapeless. Um, does it only work against the type level? Um, yes. Level? Oh, no, no, no. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, there's subsets like only there's some features that, that work against the regular compiler and some others that depend on the type level compiler. Um, no, so yeah, as of right now, um, and I think that it'll stay this way, um, Shapeless works completely with Scala C. Nothing with type level compiler at all. Um, the only things you'd see, like ever, I think, is that some annoyances might go away if you use the type level compiler. So like maybe like any wouldn't be inferred in cases that it would be, or um, you certainly like the rendering of the types might be pretty instead of like this weird notation, but yeah. And is this, um, I mean, I, I presume this is using what um, Jamie was talking about as white box macros where it's kind of reaching into the internals and to type safe without the perspective of, hey, there's no guarantee this is gonna work well in the future. Right. Um, Just guessing. No, yeah, I, I think that's fair. Um, so I mean, so definitely, uh, like like the generic macro we saw, that's implemented with Macro Paradise as an implicit macro. So it's like worse than white box in the sense that like it's not even in Scala. Mm -hmm. You have to actually pull in like Eugene Bermico's um, Scala compiler plugin to even be able to write those macros. Mm -hmm. um, by the way, you need that at compile time. So your project, if you're using Shapeless, would uh, well. Um, your project would needs to pull in Macro Paradise if you're on 2.10, I think. But but anyway, um, uh, so yes, your point about like future availability and like risk and all that, absolutely, there, there is real risk there. The the counterpoint to that though is that Shapeless is a very um, known pusher of the boundaries of the Scala compiler. So like the Scala team, the the compiler team. Um, includes Shapeless and like dbuild, like the the um, the distributed build system that they have to make sure changes to Scala don't break libraries. Shapeless is one of their key test cases. So like yeah, while uh, and we've seen this before, like features that Miles depended on got removed from Macro Paradise because as Martin and the team talked about it, they're like, well, this thing is maybe too general or too unsafe or whatever. Um, they generally will work with Miles to find ways to represent the same ideas in a safer way. So yeah, I wouldn't worry about it going away, but but yes. Mm -hmm. um, I know this is a long talk, so feel free to leave. I don't want to keep anybody here, um, but I have about 10 minutes left or so. OK, so I want to show you now how all of this stuff gets used, because that's some pretty heady stuff, right? Um, so here's S codec, right? Um, and here's like a very simple manual codec. Um, the idea here. Or a, a set of manual codecs. The idea here is I have like a six-bit integer. I like this four-bit ignore codec, like which when you encode will just write four zeros, like four zero bits. But when you decode, it'll just take four zero bits and throw them away, right? and like basically move the kind of the cursor along the input, if you will. I've got like a one-bit boolean. I've got a six-bit integer, and I can put all those together into a heterogeneous list. Um, Nothing fancy here, heterogeneous list, so I end up with a codec of int on top of a codec of unit. Kind of weird that like this ignore thing returns you units, but regardless, got a codec of boolean and a codec of int. Now, I want to like kind of play fast and loose with, with algebra here and like factor out codec, right? Like pretend like we're doing multiplication in parentheses here. I'm going to factor out codec and put the h list on the inside. And the resulting type is this, codec of int unit boolean int. And what I want this to mean is just the concatenation of all those things together. Okay, So we can do that with S codec. Um, here's how, right? Very simple. Uh, C's didn't change. C's, the, the C's variable is still the, the H list of codecs. And at the end, I just called dot two codec on it. So I have an H list I'm calling two codec one, and it inverts things for me. Now I've got a codec of H list instead of an H list of codec. 
And you can imagine this is done with, you know, extension methods, right? Implicit classes. Um, and it's going to have its own type operator called 2 hless codec. And it's going to like work the same way like Unify did or any of these type operators where it's like capturing the input type L and then it like is defined inductively um, on the shape. And we're not going to look at anywhere close to the, the, the depth on these slides we just were on the previous ones, but kind of um, the key pieces here, we've got a prepend method that's defined at the value level. Okay, no fancy implicits, nothing super fancy here. Um, it just says that if you have a codec of A and a codec of an H list, we can put them together to give you a codec of A on top of H list. Right? So it's just like the one step. And the, by the way, these are like the three methods in S codec. A codec of any given value has a size bound, like a, an estimate of how big this thing's going to be when converted to binary, and then the two directions, encode and decode. Okay, we're going to lift that method into a poly2. We haven't talked about poly2, but it's like the two-parameter version of poly1, right? Um, we're going to say, like, anytime you encounter a value, a codec value and a codec L, just prepend them using that method we just wrote. Um, and then we have this really crazy type. This is the craziest type signature. Um, we're going to say, like, given an H list of type L with this um, constraint that says, basically what this says, it's much easier to describe what it says. Give me an H list of L where every element is a codec of something. It could be a codec of int, codec of string, whatever. So this, it's like a, called a unary type constraint. Um, in this case, it's like the type constraint that verifies, you know, type constructor membership, whatever. Ugh. Um, and then we're going to call fold right. We're going to say, and this is like a regular fold right. You could have to do this with a regular list of codecs, right? Like if you had a list of codec of ints or something. Um, it's just on H list, but the idea is the same. Then we're going to have a starting point in the fold right, and then we're going to iterate over each element, right? Um, with an accumulator. And we're going to start with like the codec of H nil that says I encode and decode nothing. Like you give me an, uh, you know, you give me an empty, or you give me a bit vector to say decode this, I say here's an H nil and here's the rest of the bit vector. I didn't touch it, right? And so on, right? Um, so we have the H nil. And basically all we're going to do is walk our H list item by item prepending each one on, starting at the right and just prepending one to the front. Um, so there's some wackiness to make that all compile. Um, including this crazy thing. Um, but like this is like the implicit witness proof that like calls that apply method and like lifts all those type operators, whatever. Point is that like it all just compiles and it's the same basic pattern, like even though it's kind of crazy. But that's sort of silly, right, to build up a, a, an H list of codecs and then flip it. If for no other reason, like you're making your computer heat up much more than it needs to. Because um, it's got to compute all of those type operators, whatever. Um, you know, it's it, it, S codec's designed to let you dis, um, build up these codec of H lists directly, rather than building an H list of codecs and then inverting them. Okay, so here's the syntax for doing so. All you do is get rid of the H nil, which which maybe wasn't the best idea. I don't know. I've I've taken some flack for this, but the idea is like everything's right associative, right? Because it ends in a colon. So by getting rid of the H nil. Colons being this 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 cons method is being called on int six and it's passing bool as an argument. So now we can say that like the colon method on a codec grows the codec by one h list element, in a sense. Okay. So anyway, that's that's the syntax. So what would you your alternative to getting rid of h nil would then create your own h nil? Maybe I think that would have been more confusing. I actually like this, <laughs> so eh, some people disagree with me. Um, that's cool. Uh, maybe use Pickling or Avro or something. Um, I, no, I, I, I don't regret this decision, but I understand that like it is sort of like co-opting the con syntax, and that can be confusing. But yeah, it's just so common that like it's. I think it's important to have an operator for. Um, there are a couple crazy operators in S codec which I do regret, but that's not one of them. Um, okay, and then like finally we can put these pieces together and say. Here's a codec that's built up in that way. So three six-bit integers. The result, C, has type codec of int 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 h nil. And now convert it to a codec of point using this as method. Um, now I just have a codec of point, and then I can say encode and decode, right, and, and everything works. So like this as method is going to use everything we've talked about to bind the shapes. 
Um, it's late, so I'm not going to give you all the details, but basically we abstract over the ability to call as with this transform type class. There's some, you know, enrichment, you know, extension methods. There's more type operators. This is the big method that does all the work, the bottom here. Um, now, in this case, we're just, we're just finding one of many cases, like this transformer type's got lots of these implicit methods, but it's basically saying, you've got a type A and a generic representation of it called wrapper. We can do that conversion for you. We can automatically generate the code that converts a codec of an H list to a codec of your case class. So far, so good, but then we go back to where we started and say, well, we had this weird ignore in here. This ignore was a unit, right? And you think about it, it sort of makes sense. Like, I'm always, when encoding, I'm always going to hard code four zero bits. And when decoding, I'm always going to ignore what's there and just throw it away. So there is no value I can give you when encoding that is meaningful. But I've got to give you something. I can't make it like nothing because there is no value of nothing, right? So we use unit to say, like, we'll just give you a unit value. You're going to throw it away anyway and just going to write four zero bits. So that's cool. It works. But it makes as blow up, right? Because our case class doesn't have a unit in the middle of it. That would be silly. Um, and so as fails and says, hey, like this H list is not shape compatible with your case class. Um, and so there's this method called drop units. And so basically what drop units does is goes through an H list and for every unit type it finds, just moves, removes it. So if maybe you had a case, list, case, um, case class of 10 elements, but three of them were units, you end up with an H, a codec H list of three elements, I'm sorry, seven elements. Um, anyway, and then the rest just works. So drop units follows the same pattern, right? Like it, it's enriched on via an implicit class. It, it's got an implicit type operator to support it, et cetera. So the very last um, point um, is that we can, we can now put all this together to go back to our very original auto-generation code and say like, well, how can we auto-generate code for point, line, and arrangement, codecs for those? And say like, well, we can auto-generate for a point if we can find a generic representation of point and we can find a codec for each of its component elements in that H list. Um, and that's basically what we described earlier. Um, and like it's done with like basically four implicits. Like, and this is kind of neat that like despite everything we've talked about, like that auto generation code boils down to like two slides, I think. We say, well, how do we de generate a codec for HNL? That's easy, right? HNL, we just ignore. We've already saw it, in fact. We saw it in the prepend example, so we just return it. How do we generate a codec for a product type? This is a plain old H list. Well, we need a codec for the head of the H list, and we need a codec for the tail of the H list. And then we, given a head and a tail, we've already defined this cons method on codec that can put those together. We used that a few slides ago, and it's the syntax we're using in all the codec examples. So we can just use it. We can just call colon colon. Now it turns out there are cases, especially when you're dealing with like nested derivations. So like we ask for an arrangement and it's got to like derive arrangement line and point like all the way down a tree. Where eventually Scala sees like, you're crazy, I give up. And, and it does, it just gives up. And there's nothing wrong with your code. It's just a limitation in the way the type inference works. I mean, sorry, the, the implicit resolution works. And there's nothing you can do about it. Um, so Miles Sabin in, in Shapeless provides this thing called lazy and lazy basically says like, yeah, I know what I'm doing here. Like I want you to like exhaustive, I shouldn't say exhaustively search, but, but it does a better job of avoiding these sort of like knots that, that the Scala C gets wrapped around itself trying to, to do all this resolution. So you can effectively ignore lazy, you know, it's just working around limitations in the compiler. So the product case is not bad. The record case is pretty insane. Um, mm -hmm. Like it's the same idea, like we're gonna we're gonna walk it recursively, but we gotta deal with the fact that like now instead of just a value, we've got this field type thing, and you know, there's craziness as we want to take apart the field type and whatever. But the, the important part about derive record is that what it's used for is to know the name of the field, right? As we're deriving the case class, we can say, oh, this is a point, and like we've got an X field and a Y field. And so when when we generate this codec, we wanna grab you know, the name of this field X and make it the context for any errors that occur inside of this codec. So how long did it take you to get this right? Not to compile. <laughs> uh, well, like I said, it was iterative. So like I had support for like HLIST for like a year. And I knew nothing about records at all. You know? And then one day I was like, you know, I think I can make this a little better. And I started learning about records and it took me like you know, eight hours, let's say. You know, a couple nights of like falling asleep with a beer, like trying to figure out exactly what's going on and eventually worked it out. Um, and then a few months later, I like you know took another step, and 
Um, so anyway, this is this is a long process to for, for me to get here. Um, and then, then the last slide is um, of this is that uh, we can hook records up to the label generic thing. So we can say like, if you're looking for a case class, first give me a codec for your record representation, and then like generate the record representation by doing that crazy previous slide and you know so on. And it's just all kind of recursively works, and it doesn't tie itself in a knot because of that lazy thing. So, um, okay. Very last slide. Um, so this is this is basically my what I wanted to say today. Um, like shapeless, there, there's no question there are things that are mind bending, and it's taken me years to 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 learn all the pieces of it. But I think for me the the main um, the main thing that uh, kind of gave me all my aha moments or all my you know the the, the things that really like, cemented things into place is like learning this type operator concept, the way the inductive proofs work, like being able to reason about an error message. Um, once I kind of understood that well and understood like what that aux thing was for, then like it's pretty easy to like work through all these errors. Um, but you know, that took a few years. Um, and so the other thing to say is that uh, it absolutely pushes what Scala can do. Um, you know, to Joe's point, um, there's risk in that. Uh, there's certainly compile time impact, right? So if you're very sensitive about the amount of time things take to compile, just be aware that Shapeless will make things longer. Um, Sometimes it's like a bad definition of one of these type operators. Like in my case, the drop units example, right? Drop units was the case that had like asymptotic compile time. If you got like past like three or four elements in your structure, it went, you know, through the roof. And a very simple refactoring took it to like, um, on, you know, so small compile time, it doesn't even show up in profiling. Um, and the other thing to point out is that like, even if you're not interested in shapeless and you have zero interest in S codec because you're all JSON or whatever, that's cool. Um, but like other libraries like Slick uh, have a lot of these same features. Slick has an entire HList package. Like HList and Scala used to be just limited to the first line, like the head and the tail, right? And the very simple definition. You couldn't map over them. You couldn't fold over them. You couldn't zip them. Um, I want to say that like Miles' work in, uh, in Shapeless, um, you know, porting some concepts from the Haskell community, uh, really sort of opened up what we do with HList now. And a lot of those ideas you're seeing in things like Slick, um, which has a very functional, very, very nice HList implementation that's certainly inspired by um, Shapeless. So anyway, that's all I have for tonight. Thanks, everybody. It looks like HList have been sort of the gateway drug into Shapeless. I think so, yes. Oh, and I, the one thing I wanted to say. Um, <laughs> HLists are cool. I think what's even cooler is this thing called coproducts. Um, so HLists are sort of like tuples in a sense, right? Which is like a bunch of types all put together. Except not limited to 22. Except not limited to 22. <laughs> or another way to think about HLists actually, which is like really nice, I think, is that it's tuple twos that are right nested. Right? It's it's a, a completely isomorphic to an HList. Coproducts are like ethers that are right nested. And so then you have like this really nice parallel of like, well, um, HLists are like products, product types, right? Like a value of each of these types all put together. Coproducts, the dual of them, are some types, right? Like I've got an int and a string and a boolean. I've got one of those, not two of those, not three of those. I've got one of them. Anyway, there's all these really interesting things. Shapeless 2 is what we're using here today. Shapeless 2.2, actually. In Shapeless 3, which is under development, not actively, but like there's prototypes and stuff, HLists and coproducts are just syntax. They've been completely merged together into one concept. It's something called symmetric monoidal categories. Um, the math is above my head, but yeah. Um, but there's like some cool paper that shows how to unify all of these ideas into one concept. It's really amazing. Any other questions? Or it's late, though. I know. I think people's brains are full. <laughs> Possibly overheating. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> All right, cool. Thanks, guys. I think really the only way that I'm going to get any of this is to use it. Oh, absolutely. Well, it's, it's made a gateway for the integer. I can redefine an integer as a type. I can then pass that as a template. Yeah, but you're going to get that in Scala 212. 212? Yeah, yeah. Right. I don't know that yet. Yeah. <laughs> for me, what I want is age list. There are cases where I could use that outside of Slick, which I yeah. think we're not less happy. Yeah, and, and Shapeless, like the big area of application, absolutely is serialization libraries. 
Um, I mean, not saying it's the only place, but like I have S codec, obviously. Um, there's a lot of work being done in automatic JSON serialization. So if anybody uses spray JSON, um, uh, Sam Holiday actually just like this week has been building an automatic serializer that just takes your case classes and gives you JSON, spray JSON serializers, like root JSON formats. Oh, that's so better. Using all of these techniques. It's so much better than, that's one area where Slick falls down. Yeah. It's JSON generation, it just blows. Yep. Yep. Being able to do that and have, have it. So I imagine what he's doing under the covers then is using that generic capability to convert your case, well, label generic. Yep. Case class to label generic, and then from there, uh, transform that into JSON and back. Yep. Yeah, it seems like a very natural application. Of that. Um, and his case also is sort of like my last few slides. Like it's a 150 source lines, maybe 200 source lines. They're of, dense. Of, of unreadable code. Of unreadable, <laughs> shapeless, crazy code. Um, <laughs> But, you know, the interesting thing, too, about that is, like I've mentioned, everything we're talking about today is compile time, all the overheads in compile time. Um, the runtime overhead of this stuff is, is equivalent to using, like, tuples, right? Um, in Sam's case, he had, for work, he had uh, ridiculously large dumps of JSON data, like gigabytes of JSON data. Um, and he had a process, whatever. He had all these handwritten spray marshallers that did the, the two JSON from JSON. Um, he switched it to this auto-generated stuff, and he saw about a 5% um, decrease in performance. Um, we think, he thinks that that was because rather than like binding directly, like pull out all these fields and stick it into a case class, you're creating these nested yeah. tuples in a sense, right? right. And it's then being, sticking it yeah, into the case trans, class. The transforms. Right. right. But he said like 5% performance, cons considering I, I just saved myself thousands oh, of yeah. lines of handwritten JSON marshalling, he, he was glad to change. Yeah, okay, 5% bump. That's, so uh, that's spray JSON with like Sam Halliday's patch or whatever. It's not going to be in Spray JSON because that's a different owner, you know, different different project. Um, Sam's going to contribute it to Shapeless Contrib. So there's a project, Lars Hoople, the the one of the founders of Type Level, also the ex um, uh, maintainer of Scala Z. Um, Lars has a project called Shapeless Contrib, and it like basically takes Shapeless and integrates with lots of different open source libraries. Um, so Sam's going to contribute this to Shapeless Contrib. And there's others like if you use Argonaut, I like Argonaut. Um, yeah, there's an Argonaut shapeless already integration that exists. So the idea is then you use those together. Yeah. Like it, it implicitly augments these. Yep. Definitely worth looking into. Yeah. Anything beats hand coding JSON. <laughs> <laughs> I'll trade you binary for JSON any day. <laughs> well, even uh, that's not always useful on a REST API. Yeah, true. I mean, true. If I don't have to hand code something, that means I can't get it wrong. Yep. 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 I'll pay 5% performance penalty for that every time. Because that's still faster. The network's still going to be bigger latency than that. Yep. Good stuff. Cool. Well, thanks, everybody. Thanks. 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 Thanks.